Hello, everyone. Welcome to our next session. This session is titled Neglected Region Number One, Africa. During this session, we'll be diving into some of the challenges and opportunities for aquatic animal welfare throughout Africa. I'm Sofika Kostniuk, the Managing Director for Aquatic Life Institute. So just a couple of quick housekeeping reminders, which you've probably all memorized by this point in time, if you've been with us for the past two days. Uh, the audience is muted upon entry. Your cameras are turned off. Please post your questions to the question and answer box, and we'll answer as many of them as possible towards the end of the session. Every session is being recorded as well as being streamed live on Facebook. We expect respectful and productive discussions and do have a zero tolerance policy for any form of harassment and discrimination of any kind. This session is slotted for 60 minutes. We have three absolutely wonderful panelists. I can't wait to, uh, to hear them present and learn a lot from them. We'll spend around 30 minutes in the presentation portion and then have approximately 20 minutes for questions and answers. So um, I would like to introduce to you our three panelists, which I see have, uh, have joined me. And please, if, uh, if you're able to, um, you can, you can, um, yes, wonderful. Join us by video. Thank you so much. Okay, there we go. Uh, so first we have Mandla Gakamlana. He currently serves as the programs director at the Coalition of African Animal Welfare Organizations and is a member of the Open Wing Alliance Advisory Committee. Mandela will be presenting about the aquaculture industry and associated issues in Africa as a region as a whole. Welcome, Mandela. Next, we have Amy P. Wilson. She's based in South Africa and is the Brooks Institute for Animal Rights Law and Policy Fellow at UCLA School of Law's Animal Law and Policy Program. She's also the co-founder and director of the first organization dedicated to animal law in her country, and that is the Animal Law Reform of South Africa. So Amy will be speaking about the gaps in law and aquaculture feed, if we have enough time for that. Welcome, Amy. And lastly, we have Alfred Siwa. He's the founder and executive director of Sibanya Animal Welfare and Conservancy Trust based out of Zimbabwe and is currently studying a master's of science in animal welfare management. And uh, we'll be learning from Alfred about the aquaculture industry and fish welfare issues in Zimbabwe. Welcome, Alfred. Lovely to have all of you here. I don't wanna take up more time uh, with, with my side of the presentation. So maybe we'll just dive right in if everyone is ready and we could start off with Mandla. Over to you. If you have any slides, please feel free to share your screen. Uh, th thanks, Sofika. Uh, are you able to see my screen? Yes, that looks great, and it's taking up my whole screen. Thank you. <laughs> thanks, uh, thanks, thanks, for Sofika, uh, uh, for that uh, for that introduction and uh, greetings, colleagues. Uh, I'm joining the conference from Cape Town, South Africa. And uh, thanks once again uh, for inviting us uh, to be part of this uh, rather important gathering. Uh, much appreciated. I have a very short presentation uh, that will essentially focus on the, just give a brief overview of the aquaculture sector uh in in the african continent <clears throat> now the the africa's contribution uh, uh, to world aquaculture production is just under three uh, percent but be that as it may uh, between 1995 and 2018, the sector has seen a substantial growth. Uh, the sector, in that period, the sector grew 20-fold 
at an annual growth rate of just over 15 and a half percent. Now, now this growth is seen as being a positive by uh, African states, uh, precisely because uh, it is viewed that uh, it would translate uh, into, into increased national household and uh, level food uh, security uh, through uh, increased fish, fish availability. And that secondly, it will translate into social and economic development uh, through the creation uh, of jobs. Uh, and, and lastly, that it would also translate into a rural economic expansion uh, through increased uh, rural, uh, livelihoods. Now, 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 this seems to be a, 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 of a particular challenge for, 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 for the continent because when, 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 when looking at aquaculture development within the continent, uh, African states or governments tend to look at what the positives uh, of aquaculture development will be for its people and 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 for and and, and for and for and for its economic development. But but we all know that the reality is that uh, when you grow the aquaculture sector in any country, it also has negative impacts. You know. Uh, uh, on the country, and 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 therefore, when when, when you grow the sector or when you develop the sector, there is a need to look at it holistically, and put safety valves in place so that it does not negatively impact on other sectors. So, so, so one of what, some of the issues uh, here is that uh, the intensification of this farming practice. We know that leads to it, it, it leads to negative fish welfare issues. It leads to de the depletion of, of, of capture fisheries, which in, in aquaculture is fed to farm fish. It leads to environmental degradation and, and, and other negative impacts. And therefore, the discussion around the development of aquaculture in the continent needs to be inclusive of these negative impacts so that so that uh, uh, there the, the could be ways of mitigating them and and therefore the conversations uh, 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 currently uh, in the continent is that is that uh, these issues are at the periphery uh, these negative impacts are at the periphery of these conversations and, and therefore the challenge for animal welfare advocates is to ensure that these issues are put on the table and they form part of, of, of the agenda of, of aquaculture development. Because, because it is clear that uh, aquaculture is, is, is here to stay uh, uh, in, in our continent. But then therefore, uh, there needs to be a concerted effort by animal welfare advocates to say that uh, Aquaculture development also has a negative side, and therefore, uh, these negative issues needs to be addressed. Now, 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 the the, the increase uh, or, or 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 the the development of the sector uh, emanated from uh, the the NEPAD Fish for All Summit, which was held in Ethiopia in in two thousand and five, and Essentially, out of out from from this from this conference uh, or this meeting, uh, a plan emerged that uh, that sought to grow aquaculture at, at, at country level, at national level, in in, in all uh, African African states, and also it encouraged private sector investment through the. the through growing SMMEs and also to expand a uh, domestic fish market. Uh, when this was implemented, FAO then saw a need to, to complement uh, this plan and it put in place uh, the, the special program uh, for aquaculture development uh, uh, in Africa in 2007. And essentially, uh, 
this this FAO program sought to increase uh, aquaculture production in Africa by 200% over a period uh, of 10 years. It's all, it also sought to develop aquaculture plans in, in individual countries that would then translate into developing national uh, aquaculture legislations that would be accompanied by, by regulations that would speak to how these legislations would be implemented. And, 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 and the FAO program also envisages that these would be implemented within the context of observing the code of conduct for responsible fisheries and, and best practices. Now, now, a conversation can be had as to whether, to what extent uh, 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 the FAO program has attained its objectives. But uh, the African Union having looked at the fact that, or having anticipated that uh, the FAO program was going to come to an end, it then put in place an aquaculture action plan for Africa 2050, 2016 to, to, to 2025. And essentially this, this plan by the African Union was aimed at supporting the realization of the comprehensive Africa agriculture development program. And essentially its objectives were to create an, an enabling environment for aquaculture development uh, in the continent. It also sought to, to it is still seeks to improve service delivery uh, uh, to the sector and build capacity to ensure that there, were, there is adequate human resources with appropriate skills, information, and resources uh, in the sector. And, and most importantly, to address the glaring gap that is there that relates to, to research and development that specifically focuses uh, uh, on African aquaculture, because there's a glaring gap there. And so, and so this aquaculture action plan seeks to, to address that, to address this. And, and the way that it is, it is implemented is it's implemented by region, so that region by region, so that, so, so that a, a, a unique a regional dynamics can be taken in place can be taken into consideration as, as, it is, as the plan is, is being implemented. Uh, the, 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 the sector uh, is predominantly a, a freshwater, uh, inland freshwater systems. It's dominated by inland freshwater, freshwater systems and only 1% of the sector is, is mariculture. And it employs uh, about 6.2 million people uh, who are mostly women. And uh, if you drill down into this, you will find that uh, uh, one person that is employed in the, in the sector feeds about uh, uh, four people. So in a nutshell, that is just the, 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 the overview of, 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 of the state of the sector in, in the continent. Now, the, the, the top producers looking at this table uh, you'd see that uh, Egypt uh, is, is head and shoulders above the rest in terms of aquaculture production uh, in, in the continent. And uh, if you combine the first three producers, which is Egypt, Nigeria, and Uganda, uh, they, the three of them account for 90% of aquaculture production in the region. And uh, you would see that uh, South Africa is, 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 is at number 10. Uh, and uh, Maybe, maybe uh, my fellow panelist uh, Amy would speak to some of of the challenges that uh, that uh, that uh, that uh, place South Africa in in that position in terms of aquaculture development, considering that uh, uh, it is it, it is a leader in the in the continent economically. Now, even though even though Egypt is 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 is, is the number one producer uh, in the continent, uh, it is yet still to achieve self self sufficiency, uh, and it is the net importer of fish products. Yet it's the number one producer in the continent, and it, this is because it is the sector is developed by by many by many challenges. And within the context of Egypt, 
uh, the number one producer. The challenge is that uh, there the are resource use conflicts around water and land, which are critical for, for, for the establishment of, of, of aquaculture operations. Uh, Egypt also has uh, energy issues. Uh, there are also challenges around prices and, and availability of, 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 of quality feed. Uh, but also fundamentally, there's a void around uh, uh, having a, a comprehensive regulatory framework. And, and, and this issue would find that it, it, it is an issue that is common in, in many of the aquaculture, aquaculture producing countries in the continent that, uh, that uh, the, the, there is a void of, 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 of clear uh, and comprehensive regulatory framework that will, that will uh, um, uh, regulate uh, the sector. And, and even where there are, in, uh, even where there are frameworks in certain countries, you would find that the animal welfare component uh, is, is, is absent in, in those frameworks or, or where they are, where there is a, 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 an animal welfare component, we'd find that it's very scant. So that is the, the, that is the challenge. And, and if one look at, the, at, the, at, at, at Nigeria, which stands at number two, uh, it is also struggling uh, because it, 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 in 2017, it had an annual fish demand of, of, of 3 million tons, yet Nigeria could only produce uh, just over 1 million tons uh, uh, of, of fish products locally. And, and this huge gap in fish demand of almost uh, uh, 2 million tons is bridged uh, through importation of, of, of fish product, which, which, which is a concern. If, 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 if such a big producer in the continent is unable to supply, for example, uh, uh, sufficient uh, fish products uh, uh, for its local population, considering that one of, the, one of the rationales for expanding aquaculture in the continent is to ensure that there is availability uh, uh, of fish products locally. And, and, and some of the challenges that are bedeviling, bedeviling uh, 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 Nigeria as well is, is, is the high cost of fish feed, and also there are challenges around the availability of land and, and reliable uh, water resources. And also they have challenges around uh, 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 disease uh, uh, management, capacity to, to manage uh, 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 diseases. Now, now this picture, uh, uh, it is very concerning because if the, 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 the top two uh, producing countries are struggling, uh, one can, can, can only imagine what the other countries lower uh, uh, in, the, in, in, the, in, the, in the production uh, 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 chain uh, are confronted with. And therefore, the, the, the needs to be a, a, a systematic way of ensuring that uh, the, the plans that are there to develop uh, uh, the sector, uh, 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 civil society engage with, this, uh, with them at the national level, and, 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 and also to ensure that uh, national governments are engaged because they are signatories to, to, to these regional uh, covenants, and therefore they need to be engaged to ensure that uh, uh, they implement them. Uh, and, 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 and lastly, in terms of addressing the, the, some of the issues that uh, I, I, I have highlighted in the, in, the, in, in, the, in the presentation, I think uh, uh, there is the need for, for, for animal welfare advocates to be part of the planning process, to be part of the legislative developing processes, so as to ensure that the animal welfare components of those instruments are strong enough to, to ensure that they are animal welfare friendly, to ensure that uh, they, are, they, are, they, are, they are also socially responsible uh, and contribute to community well being through public private partnerships and also through the involvement of, of young people and, and women empowerment. And also to ensure that 
uh, uh, these instruments are, are environmentalist are sustainable and so so as to ensure that they do not they, they do not create disruptions to the ex ecosystem and also lead to to loss of of of, of bio, biodiversity and 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 these things can only happen if if a civil society and 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 as animal welfare advocates on the ground uh, we engage the powers that be and we we put these issues uh, on the agenda so that animal welfare can be mainstreamed uh, in, in aquaculture development uh, uh, in the continent uh, th thank you very much, uh, Sofika, for, for 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 the time to 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 do this presentation, and uh, and uh, we 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 as Kawo, we are happy and 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 would like to to engage and collaborate uh, with uh, uh, with other uh, animal welfare advocates uh, across the world and and the globe, and to learn from each other, and, and therefore uh, I I can be reached on on on. On, on to my email uh, as, as shown on this last slide. Uh, thanks, Sofika. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mandla. What a what a fascinating presentation. Wonderful, succinct overview of such a giant giant region um, that is typically neglected. So um, thank you. You may have seen my eyebrows almost hit the ceiling a few times when you were speaking about the aggressive rate of growth plans uh, for, for aquaculture industry expansion. So um, it's really good to know that yourself and the other panelists are on top of these issues and, and flagging them for those that need to be aware of some of the, um, some of the concerns and uh, considerations that need to be incorporated as, as plans unfold. Um, okay, thank you again. And I will turn it over to Amy, please go ahead. Great, thanks so much. Let's see. My screen will start sharing soon. So I wanted to say a big thank you, of course, to the organizers of the event. It's been uh, absolutely wonderful to be with colleagues doing such amazing work. And of course, I'm particularly excited to be with my fellow Africans discussing the neglected region of Africa. I'm gonna be focusing on South Africa today and really um, trying to highlight a couple of the, the main issues that are happening right now, and particularly uh, some of the regulatory and policy issues that have allowed some of these issues to arise. And then I'm briefly going to touch on some of the opportunities uh, that we can look forward to ahead. So obviously, all of these are really complicated issues. I'm just going to be skimming the surface um, in the time provided. But I, I did want to start off by saying the context in South Africa particularly is extremely complicated. Uh, uh, understand every country has its unique uh, complications and problems, but obviously South Africa is still dealing with the continuing legacy of apartheid. We're one of the most unequal societies in the entire world. We have an extremely high unemployment rate. Um, there's massive inequality among people who are struggling to get livelihoods. There's an energy crisis. So all of this becomes really relevant when we're looking at the policies that the government is trying to promote and particularly for um, aquatic life and the ocean and coastal regions of the country. So all of this needs to be considered in a much broader context um, and some of the rationale for why these policies are being pushed. And also currently, I would also be remiss not to point out that these two massive die-offs happening right now in the country. Uh, thousands of seals are dying, and although the cause is yet to be determined, the initial tests are showing that it's due to malnourishment. So obviously, this is another contextual issue that is extremely important for aquatic species that has massive implications for the ecosystems. And another massive issue happening at the moment is avian flu. And over 10,000 endangered species have died from this. So in this context of all the other threats that are happening to these animals, to these species, to these habitats, we're having these increasing threats and problems that are impacting them on a massive scale. And this leads me to Operation Fakisa, which is um, one of the policies of the South African government to implement the National Development Plan. So in the context of, of, of inequality and unemployment and poverty, one of the ways to combat these and to make a better life for all citizens in an inclusive society is Operation Fakisa. And the word Fakisa comes from the Susutu word, which means hurry up. And it really illustrates the government's um, <clears throat> intention to speed up the process of development to really get things going and running in the economy so that people have an opportunity to try and 
catch their breath and, and live a, a good, healthy life. And uh, the problem with this is that um, although there has many notable aims and achievements that it wants to accomplish, uh, we need to be very critical of the ways and the means that they are accomplishing this and who are these results for and at what cost are we achieving them. So I'm going to touch on just two of these. There are six main predominant work streams through which the government has identified um, to implement this policy. I'm only going to be touching very briefly on the first two, which is offshore oil and gas exploitation and aquaculture. Unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to go into the others today. So uh, in terms of the 2019 progress report on Operation Fakisa, they really obviously are emphasizing this ocean's economy and the uh, opportunity for the oceans to unlock this massive potential for jobs. As I mentioned, unemployment is a major problem in the country and in to increase the gross domestic product, the GDP of the country. So again, this emphasis on economy, on growth, on development. And then in contrast with that, one of the challenges that was identified in this uh, progress report two years ago, one of the critical issues is this green revolution and how it has exacerbated the situation further supported by the Paris Accord. So we're really seeing here that they're seeing the uh, preservation of the environment and protection of the environment and all these different tools that we're using, including our international obligations, they're seeing this as a barrier to the achievement of this uh, policy. So it's very important to acknowledge that, and I'll, I'll show a very uh, tangible example of that soon. Uh, there's no mention, obviously, of course, of the marine life and the animals and the impact that it has on them. And this leads me to one of the, the things that are happening currently in South Africa. It's all over the news. You may or may not have seen it in international uh, media yet, but Shell and Shearwater Geo Services are about to start 3D offshore seismic surveying off our coast. This is for an area of 6,000 square kilometers or 23,000 square miles approximately. This is gonna continue for four to five months, every single day, 24 hours a day. They're gonna be firing extremely loud shockwave emissions in order to try and find oil and gas deposits. This is of course gonna affect extremely sensitive uh, acoustic beams from cetaceans all the way down to the tiniest of plankton and mollusks and corals and shellfish. So really the entire ecosystem, uh, I'm not gonna go into all of the different things and the, the problems that this can cause, but research has shown us from other areas and even in fact areas within South Africa, that this is obviously not a very good thing for marine life that are impacted by this. It's also happening during the migratory season for certain species. So obviously they try to do it outside of the, the migratory season, but it's not possible to do it for all species. And I will say that this, the decibels are extremely, extremely high. So the effects are going to be damaging. And when we look at the response by Shell, they essentially have said that they have complied with all of the relevant legislation. They've undergone a stakeholder consultation. They've gotten their environmental authorization. They've complied really with everything that they need to in the government's given a stamp of approval. And then of course, they do say that they'll follow international best practice and that there are sufficient safeguards in place. Uh, unfortunately, the transfer block exploration right within which this is the target area for, there are a number of marine protected areas. So although they're saying that the activities are not gonna be taking place in the marine protected areas and that there is a sufficient buffer zone, sound can travel extremely far and scientists are saying that this is simply not good enough and obviously the animals and the areas are still gonna be impacted by this. Uh, the Department of Forestry, Fisheries and Environment, which is the government entity responsible for environment, has essentially washed their hands of the situation and said that they have not been involved in the decision making. This was by another department, the Department of Mineral Resources, who are the department that issue these um, rights and that who do the EMPs, for example. And they essentially have washed their hands and they said they've passed the buck on to somebody else. So all of this is in the context of the fact that the world has just agreed to move away from fossil fuels in South Africa is promoting them and looking at new ways to exploit these rights. Uh, obviously, aside from the massive detrimental environmental impacts and, and impacts on aquatic life and species throughout the entire ecosystem, the public is outraged. There's over 100,000 signatures right now. Local communities are enraged. They are not happy with this. Um, it's going to impact the rights of small scale fisher folks. There's just been a massive allocation of small scale fishing rights. So you can see that the, the vast majority are not happy with this for the benefit of a multinational corporation in the country. Um, I've left a couple of links there for anyone who's interested in finding out more or signing the petition. I do encourage you to look at this. It's a very much a developing issue, but it's 
highly controversial and important in the context of aquatic life and, and will have major impact if it's left to proceed. And we are looking at um, exploring different options now as to what we can do. So uh, we are watch this space. The next thing I want to touch on just uh, very quickly is aquaculture. And of course, Manda did a great job of looking at um, Africa as a whole. South Africa, like many of its counterparts, are looking at imp uh, increasing aquaculture. This is one of the um, Operation for Peace objectives. But importantly, as we know, it's not just for mariculture or um, in, the, in the sea, we look at freshwater as well. So I will say in terms of regulation, the landscape is completely um, uh, inadequate at regulating the issues that we know arise from aquaculture. There was a push in 2018 to introduce the Aquaculture Development Bill. And in fact, that piece of legislation was extremely robust in the sense that it looked at regulating a number of important issues. Um, it would have been the most robust law that we have for regulating farmed animal issues. One of the provisions was about the minister promulgating standards. And Mandla will know that we uh, tried to ensure that it, we changed that from a may prescribe minimum standards to a must prescribe minimum standards so that they were actually legally obliged to put standards in place. There are currently no standards for any farmed animals in South Africa, and largely it's relied on soft law. So if that change was made, that would be a, a massive improvement. Um, so right now, the bill has currently been withdrawn, although, um, and I'm sure Manda will touch on this uh, in the Q&A, they are looking at reintroducing it. As I understand, one of the reasons why it was withdrawn and it didn't get much uh, legs or traction, so to speak, is because the definition of aquaculture was meant to include crocodiles. And we have a massive crocodile farming industry in the country. So, which leads me to my next point. And since we're talking about neglected species and areas and jurisdictions, I think we do tend to focus a lot on aquaculture for marine species, but it's also important to note that there are a number of other species that are grown in South Africa. There's 72,000 approximately, we don't have accurate numbers. Crocodiles are harvested per year. I very much dislike that word harvested, but um, we, we are not aware of the total amount because there's not proper recording. Uh, and this, of course, is for their leather, it's for meat, and then it's also these animals are used in the tourism industry. So aside from the fact that uh, this is a massive public safety risk, um, earlier this year, at least 40 escaped in one incidence, uh, crocodiles, and in 2013, as many as 15,000 escaped. So this is obviously a really uh, big public safety risk. Uh, it's also a massive risk for the people who are working in this industry who don't have proper training and safeguards in place. And then there's a plethora of other issues that arise in the context of farming wild animals. Of course, the welfare is largely neglected. These animals are not meant to be farmed in large quantities. So everything from their rearing to their transportation to the slaughter is completely problematic from a welfare perspective. Previous undercover investigations, including by PETA, have shown that there's extreme cruelty in these industries in, in South Africa and then also in other countries where crocodile farming takes place, for example, in Australia. So uh, in terms of the regulation, as I mentioned, there's currently no overarching aquaculture bill because that uh, aquaculture development bill is not in place. We don't have proper standards. So largely industry relies on soft law or self-regulation where they have helped draft the standards in consultation with others. Um, but these are voluntary and non-binding and not properly enforced. And then, of course, in the international context, CITES applies for the trade, um, but they are listed species, but there are certain exemptions and there's quotas for them. So largely, again, the regulatory uh, framework which governs aquaculture is extremely problematic. So this is not just for crocodiles. I will say we are obviously farming um, massive numbers of other species, but this is just an example to show some of the gaps and problems with this. So um, just given the time, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but I will say in terms of the regulatory framework generally, we have a beautiful constitution, which I believe we can use to actually get better protection for both human and non-human animals, and specifically in some of the contexts that we see this arising for these harms, such as through offshore oil and gas drilling and aquaculture, because as we know, this impacts on humans too. Uh, we are in the process of updating our Animals Protection Act. Currently, there's a bit of um, uncertainty about whether this properly applies to aquatic species or even wild animals due to the definition, but we'll see what happens next year or if and when they release this new legislation. And then again, last year, there was a push to include aquatic species in the Meat Safety Act. So there are things that are happening, but there hasn't. They, neither of these have been promulgated yet. So. Um, looking ahead, I'm, I'm obviously going to say that regulation is absolutely essential as we see lack of regulation leads to massive exploitation and 
huge amount of problems. And Amanda alluded to this too, we need to put appropriate safeguards in place. On the one hand, if we are promoting these industries and really encouraging their growth, we absolutely need to ensure that we're doing this properly from, from a human, non-human animal and environmental perspective. We need to preempt some of the issues we've seen arise in other jurisdictions. So we can definitely learn from the mistakes that other jurisdictions have made and put this properly into our law. We can also learn from some of the issues we've seen with other farmed animals, because of course this will become relevant in the aquaculture context. We need to have holistic, inclusive regulation that's good for people's animals and the environment. Um, I believe mandating alternatives is also going to be important. Um, of course, in South Africa, our constitution requires us to look at our international obligations, which includes things like the Paris Agreement and the World Organization for Animal Health. Um, and then, as I mentioned, I think our constitutional rights are really going to be um, important when we're looking at bringing further action and protection. So. Um, Last of all, uh, I will say there are some positive things. The, the first cell-based sea company, uh, seafood company has started in Africa and there are a number of plant-based and other alternatives. And I, I, there I, I've just listed a number of, of other things that I think will be critical in us get, getting better protection for aquatic species in the country. So with that, that's my time. Thank you for your attention. And I'm going to stop there. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, those, those visuals and some of these uh, quick clips of stories just completely drew me in, uh, but also introduced for me an entirely new layer of consideration uh, from the seismic surveys to crocodile farming, things I hadn't thought of necessarily or were popping top of mind. So it's just an incredibly complicated landscape. Um, I'm very happy to have you <laughs> keeping an eye on all this, but you know, mm -hmm. the question of how do we drill down into something that um, can, can yield positive results in a quick time frame? That's, I guess that's the challenge of civ sieving all these issues through to, to get to the nuggets where we can really dig in. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, wonderful. And now to our third and final panelist, Alfred, please go ahead. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm still trying to share my screen. Uh, Christine, may you please assist and share my screen? I think I have a challenge. Um, I will basically look at uh, our countries, but the major focus will be in Zimbabwe itself uh, on what has happened. Actually, Zimbabwe is a landlocked country uh, that uh, has no much of history when it comes to aquatic farming. Uh, it has been doing uh, limited farming when it comes to fisheries. But because of the market and the climatic conditions, uh, Zimbabwe is trying to promote fisheries to a larger extent, to such that they even changed the ministry recently uh, to a ministry of agriculture, uh, lands, and fisheries. I'm, I'm just trying to check my screen. Christina can't find it. I changed it, do you see it? Okay. So Zimbabwe boasts 60% uh, of uh, inland dams in Southern Africa. Uh, and it is the one of the largest uh, growers of inland aquatic uh, animals that include tilapia fish, uh, which are grown mainly in Kariba, which is the river that we share with Zambia and Mozambique. Uh, and that on its own makes Zimbabwe to makes Zimbabwe to be one of the countries that has a, a powerful farming in the fisheries. Uh, I hope I don't have a challenge of internet because I think I'm missing something myself. 
Uh, so unfortunately, while it's we're doing that, Zimbabwe's human rights abuses affect its policies and it affects its farming policies because it is very, very difficult uh, to change the situation that Zimbabweans operate in. The situation actually requires that there is an overhaul of the entire policy when it comes to aquaculture. And actually, while the ministry is promoting fisheries, there is no policy that picks them up. Uh, the policy that we are using, the animal welfare policy that we are using in Zimbabwe, it is uh, old and a cake. Uh, it was last revised in 1983. We have pushed it to be revised, uh, revision of the policy. The challenge that we are facing is that quite a number of people are employed in the aquaculture industry. We are talking about 2.4 million people, especially women, that are working in the aquaculture industry. And some of them even doing it for themselves uh, since it has been promoted by the ministry. And you find that the same uh, industry that has no regulation has a very good market, which is Asia. Uh, Zimbabwe has a good relationship with China, and you find that uh, all our things beyond that the government talks about promotion of international trade, uh, all our market goes to China. It's not only aqua, uh, aqua fisheries that we're talking about. We talk about uh, minerals and everything else that we have. It's exported to Asia. So the other thing that the government hides in is that it is sanctions, it is under sanctions. So with those sanctions, they regulate uh, the trade with other countries. So you find that the fisheries in Zimbabwe is more influenced by the Chinese. Uh, the way forward, uh, in, in the way how we can campaign for our fish farming, we need to create a regulatory framework in Zimbabwe. We also need to research on feeding and fish farming uh, perceptions within the communities, because this was just brought in as a rushed program. Everybody is digging a, an inland dam or an inland fish pond to just grow the tilapia fish. There is no regulation and there is no policy. And you find that there is no advocacy and campaign uh, that is being done by uh, the people that are there, the people that are in, the, are, are in the leadership. And when you when you engage communities that do that, the only thing that they look at is uh, them making getting some income from the fish. Uh, whatever happens to fish themselves, whatever happens to crocodiles that Amy mentioned earlier on, it's not their concern. It is an industry that, that is supposed to make money for the communities and for everyone else. Uh, and we lack uh, a strategic review that leads us into a correct way that concerns the welfare of the aquatic animals. Uh, it, the concern is only on human consumption and human populations. So what we can say is the way forward that we need to carry on again is we need to engage our government uh, and have a proper policy framework that will help in growing of this uh, fish in Zimbabwe. But unfortunately, as I said, I alluded to earlier on, there is no strategic plan that leads us to that. We are just uh, growing and growing. The other thing that uh, I mentioned earlier on is that uh, when Zimbabwe engaged in land reform program, uh, it was so key on one political party. And you find that the political party makes uh, it very difficult for anyone difficult for us to discuss the area that needs serious advocacy abuses. And we have one political party. economy that we have in the country. Uh, everybody is involved.
Alfred, you, um, I believe, I'm sorry, you've hit the mute button on your computer perhaps. And the sound is a little bit choppy, so I'm not sure if you'd like to turn off your video to preserve some bandwidth. Most everything is coming through, but, but I'll let you know. Thanks, Sophia. Uh, am I now audible? Okay. Uh, I was saying that because of the economic environment that we have in Zimbabwe, you find that uh, there is so much corruption, not only in aquatic life, but even in terrestrial life. There is so much trade of uh, rhino horns, uh, elephant tusks, but all that is done illegally. So it's very, very difficult to regulate one area. Uh, that is the aquatic life and leave the rest of the areas unregulated. That is inclusive of the minerals. So I think we need to conclusively deal with the entire industry or the entire animal warfare industry, animal industry, so that at least uh, Zimbabwe comes in. You find that the biggest uh, routes that I used are Mozambique, uh, Zambia, and possibly now uh, Malawi. Uh, those are the biggest routes that I use for our trade. So in that, I would end by saying that uh, needs us to have a proper policy framework, uh, which I think we are working on that uh, with Manja uh, and Kao. We are working on policy framework and engaging policymakers actually in Southern Africa. Uh, I think uh, in brief, that's my presentation. Thank you so much, Alfred. Um, really, really interesting. It actually sounds like, well, that's wonderful. You're already connected with Mandela, but it sounds like uh, bringing Amy in for some consultations as well could, uh, could really help inform a, a far more sustainable path forward. So um, this, this is a wonderful composition of panelists. I think that we have a lot to uh, discuss today and, uh, and obviously beyond the conference. Thank you to all three of you. I know that we have a, a series of questions lined up here. So I will, I'll just dive right into that. We have just a little over 10 minutes left together. Um, so we might not be able to get through everything, but uh, let, let's give this a shot. First question is for Mandela. Mandela, you mentioned that the top 10 producers um, and you mentioned the top 10 producers and that animal welfare is very scarce at present. How can we package or sell the importance of animal welfare considerations in a way that producers would be most receptive to those recommendations? Thanks, thanks Sophie. I think, I think the, the point of departure has to be a uh, public uh, awareness raising. I think that's that, that's the first thing, because if, if if the outcry comes from the bottom, which is the public, then uh, then uh, it's likely to be to have more impact, <laughs> uh, and, and therefore that that has to be a, to to be the approach that even even when as uh, as, as as NGOs we engage corporates. Uh, when corporates know that uh, this as NGOs we have a base in the form of, of, of the public, then the, the likelihood of us being taken seriously is great. Secondly, I think there's also a need to, in engaging corporates, uh, there's also a need to, to, to educate them because as you engage with corporates, you would find that uh, the, there is also a, an element of, of of, of, of not knowing these issues. But not only in terms of corporate, but also at, 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 at government level, where poly, policymakers are, there's a need to meaningfully uh, 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 engage them. <clears throat> uh, hence, hence we, have, we have taken the route of sort of also developing a, a, a information disseminating material in the form of infographics 
that can be used by, by, by the public, that can be used by, 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 by corporates, that can also uh, uh, and, and, and develop policy briefs that can engage you know, with, uh, with policy makers so, so that all of these key stakeholders can get to understand that this important issue around aquatic animal welfare and, and once we have done that, then I think I think we, we would be we would be halfway there. But I don't think that it's it, it, it's a fight that can on that as animal advocates we can wage on our own, you know. And and I think when when you give people information and then you engage them and they also engage you from an informed point of view, it sort of it sort of makes things easy uh, and makes also. The, and, and makes uh, gravitating towards the, the ultimate goal uh, much more much more easier. And and lastly, I think I, I think uh, public engagement also has to go hand in hand with engaging policymakers because when policies change, when there are when there are regulatory mechanisms in place, you know. Uh, then it, it's easier for even for corporates to, to, to change their thinking because one of the things that you are confronted with is that corporates will tell you that, but I'm not breaking any law because the, 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 there's no policy, there's no, the, there's, no, there's, no, there's no legislation that speaks to this, so I'm not breaking any law, so, so why should I listen to you? So, so it needs to be a multifaceted approach. Thanks, Sofika. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more, Mantla. Um, it, the pressure does have to come from various angles, but without that initial um, outcry or, or raising the flag from the consumer base or, or sort of the bottom, the most public um, public facing space, that the incentive isn't there either for corporations or for legislation to, to change. So thank you very much for, for sharing your perspectives on that. Um, Next question, this one is for Amy. Amy, how do you envision establishing widespread welfare regulations for aquaculture, specifically in South Africa, um, particularly for something more niche, such as crocodile farming that has really captured people's imagination? Um, what do you believe would be the most effective path moving forward? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, so I think, and I think I mentioned this in my presentation. So currently there are these kind of soft laws that are developed um, by the South African Bureau of National Standards. So these are actually really robust in terms of the welfare provisions that they have. So they do consult with experts in terms of specific species and, and what would be the best for them. The problem with these standards is A, that, that they are voluntary and unenforceable and B, that the, the vast majority of the consultation is done um, with industry. So I think to the extent that um, we would be able to incorporate those welfare standards into law to make them legally enforceable and binding and that animal welfare and animal protection representatives uh, were actually better represented on, um, on those bodies. I think that would be one way to do it. Um, I, and I think uh, acknowledging that it's a developing field. So as we learn more about science, we need to build in uh, protection. So uh, as we learn more about specific species, that those are properly incorporated into legislation. But I'd say one key thing that we're missing right now is that animal protection and animal welfare um, is not properly represented in these bodies. So making sure that they, at least these animals have a seat at the table um, and their representatives are there would be the key. Um, and then, of course, making sure that they are voluntary enforceable and that they are, um, sorry, not voluntary, they are enforceable and that they are being enforced would be the next step. So I think a lot needs to happen. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if that answers. So crocodiles is just one, but obviously every species is different. So it would have to be done on a, a case by case basis. Okay, great. We have to we have to figure out how to get you, Amy, onto all these uh, legislative and policy setting bodies. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, next question. This one is for Alfred. Since you mentioned much of the aquaculture market in Zimbabwe is exported to Asia, could you also speak to some of the impacts that Asia's demand for fish meal and fish oil has on other parts of Africa? Thank you so much. 
Um, I would like to believe that uh, the demand of Asia actually is affecting the whole of Africa because uh, it, it affects the welfare issues. Uh, Why this Africa uh, is failing to provide for itself and then the demand makes it worse. Uh, the farmers and the, the governments are trying to please the, the Asian market and then neglecting the African market. And also looking at how best, uh, looking at not the best of animals, of the, the animals, they look at the best of making money rather than uh, of the animals and the humans that are in Africa. So you find that it's more, it's more money forecast, uh, economically forecast than humanely forecast and uh, relatively even the people that live within the continent. Uh, it's even affecting uh, the construction levels of the dams. Uh, people are being so that there is Alfred, I'm I'm uh, sorry, we're having that is created for fisheries. So Africa does not consider itself because of the demand that is coming from Asia things because the government and the internet connections. Am I clear now? That it's much better uh, actually. The government don't off. consider themselves. The government don't consider themselves and the humans. They look at uh, the, the money aspect. So the, the oils and everything else is now focusing on the Asian market. You find that even the wild fisheries are, are caught in huge numbers so that they provide for the Asian markets and nothing else. So everything now is Asian focused and it is now influencing uh, the production and the care of African aqu aquaculture industry. Thank you very much. Um, so, so the magic formula of people, planet, profit is uh, still something that uh, that requires a lot of attention to uh, equal out equal out that balance because it sounds like it's very heavily skewed towards profit only, and we know that that's not sustainable, um, even in the short term, most of the time. Thank you so much, Alfred. Maybe we have time for one more question. So I'm going to squeeze that in. Um, and this is really for anyone on the panel. So please uh, jump in if, if you want to tackle this one. Um, what farmed aquatic species pose the greatest welfare concerns, in your opinion, as a function of both quantity as well as a function of the challenge that there is to, to work with that species. And this is for anyone and it, it's your own personal opinion. So I would say there's no right or wrong. Uh, in brief, I would say the fish, that's the tilapia fish. Uh, in the on what I've seen, I'll say the tilapia fish. And then we have someone else who, um, yes, and anyone else, Amy or Alfred, any thoughts on that one? Just in terms of volume and um, I guess complexity of issues for any species that's being farmed. I believe Manta wanted to respond to that, but I'm, I'm, he's appearing as a participant, as an attendee and not a panelist anymore. So <laughs> I'm not sure that he can. Oh, you're on mute. Sorry, is someone able to help Mandela um, with his audio and promote him? promote him back. He should be able to speak now. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks, Sophika. My, my apologies. Uh, uh, we, we, we just got into load shedding, as you mentioned, uh, Amy. So, so I got cut off. Yeah, but, but I, got, I, I got the question. I mean, in South Africa, for example, uh, uh, we've got uh, abalone and, and, and lobster. 
which 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 are a cause for for serious concern because they are high value species they've been exported to 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 asia uh, and and therefore they are they are farmed uh, in, in huge numbers and uh, and one of the concerns around that is that to run those farms i mean uh, for, for for those two species i mean aquaculture naturally is not is, is not labor intensive so to run those farms you, you you need you need people with expertise but because really uh, the, the focus is on making maximum profits and because there's not really tight regulations you would find that in, in the, their farm the, the farmers get away uh, with a lot of with, with a lot of of wrong things and, and that and, and those two species for me are, are a source of serious concern and and, and also it's to, to prove I mean I mean the fact that that can also be proven by the fact that it's not easy to even gain access uh, to, to to this to these aquaculture farms uh, uh, in South Africa uh, Precisely because we, we can only surmise it's because that uh, the 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 regulatory issues or, or animal welfare issues that uh, that uh, uh, would would raise eyebrows. So 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 for me those those are those those would be the two those would be the two species that uh, I think uh, uh, would be of serious concern and 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 and, and, and you find that even. Uh, uh, the, the, they are not readily available or easily accessible to 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 community members, you know, uh, because they are, they are farmed for for export, and and that and that defeats uh, the rationale for expanding uh, and growing aquaculture uh, in the continent, because if 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 as communities were unable to, to have access and consume uh, 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 products that are farmed at our doorstep, you know, that, that, that's a cause for concern. And that also speaks to, 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 to a policy gap as well. So those would be the two species in my response to the question. Thanks, Sofika. Thank you so much. Um, that, that's Fascinating. I'm learning a lot uh, today, just in this last hour. We will wrap up now, unfortunately, even though this conversation could continue for many days, I'm sure. So um, first of all, I would like to get, again extend a, a huge thank you to Amy, to Alfred, to Mandla for your wonderful contributions and everything that you were able to share with us today. Um, I invite all of the conference at attendees to please keep your eyes out for post-conference communications to keep the conversation going and continue being involved in protections for aquatic animal species. Our next session is starting in about seven minutes. Hopefully people can join us there and that will focus on capture fisheries welfare research. Um, so apart from that, please continue to follow the Aquatic Life Institute on social media and visit our website, ali.fish, for more information. And lastly, we encourage everyone to continue networking and following the current agenda on the Whova app. Um, if you've downloaded that, please engage with it. Apart from that, I wish everyone a wonderful and safe rest of the week. Stay well and please stay in touch.